America at war with herself. Brother against brother and neighbor against neighbor, a bitter, sad, and tragic affair. Yet the Civil War was the making of the United States, a fiery trial in the immortal words of its greatest president. The war's repercussions are still with us today, but it was also four years of blood and horror, sweat and tears, death and destruction. A quarter of those who took part did not survive to tell the tale. Almost as many Americans died as in all the other wars the United States has fought before and since. It was a war that began with cavalry charges and infantry clashes redolent of Napoleonic times, but that ended with slaughter by massed rifles on a murderous scale. It was the first war to be covered by the camera and the first to be fought between literate masses. Some of the diaries and letters written by those who participated make powerful reading even today. But to those who fell on the field of battle, it will always remain an unfinished story. One of the most evocative sounds in the world, suggesting the frontier and the West. In the 85 years between the War of Independence and the Civil War, the West was where the United States was growing fastest. And it was in the West, of course, where North and South first came to blows over slavery. Yet, at a time when the sheer size of the country, as well as the differences between its peoples and regions, was threatening the survival of the great federal experiment, keeping it on the rails, as it were, was that reducer of the miles, the train. Although a relative newcomer to the American scene, the train would play a vital role in the Civil War. It was the first war in which it did. Without the Iron Road, the United States would never have flourished. 
By the eve of the Civil War, the four million Americans who had broken away from Britain had become 31 million, and the original 13 states of the Union had increased to 33. But not everyone welcomed this expansion, certainly not those living in the South. Southerners, in particular, felt that their distinctive way of life was threatened. Indeed, the South was increasingly seeing itself and being seen as different from the rest of the nation. Nothing symbolizes the Southern way of life more than the great plantation houses of Louisiana and Virginia, South Carolina and Mississippi, Alabama and Georgia, that have still survived in all their splendor. The South was the richest region in the land, boasting far more millionaires than anywhere else. Southerners liked to flaunt their wealth, importing antiques and sumptuous furnishings from Europe. Most of these fortunes had been built on growing tobacco, rice, or sugar, or more often, cotton. The people who worked these plantations, which immediately set the South apart from the rest of the country, especially the North, were slaves. In the decades leading up to the Civil War, the South's economy and distinctive way of life rested on the twin pillars of cotton and slavery. Planting avenues of oaks and laying out magnificent gardens, as well as building such beautiful mansions, Southerners firmly believed they had brought the best of Western traditions to the American continent, that they were the true inheritors of European civilization. Yankees and others were dismissed as mere barbarians, obsessed with material things rather than matters of the heart and mind. A popular saying in the South then was that the Northerner loved to make money, the Southerner to spend it. The South had always been a class society. It was the least changing region of the land. Indeed, many would argue that its problem was that it was not developing in the same way or at the same pace as other parts of the country, especially the North. And there was the rub. While the North became increasingly industrial and city-oriented, the South remained agricultural and rural. It differed in other ways, too. It was the only part of the country that had state-supported military academies. It had a great military tradition. It had the English tradition of the eldest son uh, taking over the plantation and the second son going into the law and the third son going into the church, that kind of thing. Its attitude toward women was pretty much that of uh, Victorian England rather than of New England or New York City. They sent their children to military schools even when they weren't necessarily going to practice uh, uh, the profession of arms. Uh, they uh, called each other colonel, major. Uh, they dueled. Uh, they believed in, in martial ways of settling things. Uh, there was more violence, for example, in Mississippi in 1850 than in all the New England states. Uh, and yet uh, uh, the population was only a fraction of that. But they also believed in the ethic of honor. And this meant that they believed that their reputations counted for a great deal. It was not just a matter of the upper classes feeling this way, but also those in the lower classes. So that, for example, if a yeoman farmer's daughter was to get herself sexually uh, in trouble in some fashion, he would feel obliged to get out the old shotgun and make sure that uh, the uh, erring party uh, married her and uh, protected the family honor. So it was a question of reputation, it was a question of family loyalty. It extended into politics, it extended into the way they handled the slaves. Of course, any slave society almost must have a system of honor as its background, because the slave is the one who gives the honor to the master. What could be more ennobling to a master than to have loyal servants who do everything at his beck and call? And when they don't, then he feels himself disgraced and he must respond to that with violence, perhaps, against those slaves. Hey, 
Sprung from a revolution which proclaimed all men to be created equal, the United States had become by the 19th century the largest ever slave-owning nation. The first Negroes were brought to Virginia in 1619, just 12 years after the establishment of the initial settlement there at Jamestown, and 12 months before the Mayflower reached Massachusetts Bay. By the end of the 17th century, their numbers had grown considerably, and they were not confined simply to the southern colonies. Indeed, the trade in slaves, which had become highly lucrative, was in the hands of northerners, mostly merchants from New England. When the 13 original colonies broke away from Britain in 1776, Negroes made up more than one in six of the population. Blacks at that time outnumbered free whites in South Carolina. Slavery was retained in Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, and Georgia, as well as the two Carolinas. It was abolished, though, almost straight away in the seven northern states. One of the things that uh, we tend to forget is that in the 17th century, slavery was not the first system of labor that the Southerners used. They were using indentured servants. Already that differentiated them from the North, because although indentured servants were also used there, not to the same degree. In the 18th century, slavery replaced the indentured servant class, however, and profits were so enormous from the tobacco culture that developed in Virginia, and then the rice culture that developed in South Carolina, that of course the institution of slavery continued and prospered extremely well. And then in the 1790s, with the invention of the cotton gin, you had the vast expansion uh, using slaves for that purpose, the raising of cotton. This, of course, differentiated the South from the North economically from the very start. If one asks how important slavery was in the antebellum South, the most obvious response is to say that about uh, one quarter of the families in the South actually owned at least one slave. Now, this may not seem like a great number if one talks about a slave society, but uh, one historian rather ingeniously compared the proportion of slaves held in the South uh, to the uh, uh, number of people or the proportion of people who had uh, stock in corporations or had Im personal employees. And uh, it's quite uh, strikingly different. I mean, it's uh, four or five times a greater proportion of people holding slaves in the South uh, than in, in modern times holding that kind of property. Uh, but more important is the fact that uh, slavery was the very source of uh, income uh, for the uh, society as a whole, for its profits. 75% of cotton was produced on plantations, that is, farms of having 10 slaves or more. So the very heart of the southern economy came out of slavery. And if slavery were really going to be called into question, as uh, some northerns seemed to be suggesting in the 1850s, uh, even someone who held one slave uh, would feel that uh, his or her property uh, was uh, going to be jeopardized, just as uh, today if one held owned a house uh, and the values of housing fell in one's home area, uh, this would be a, a real threat. A southern congressman, a southern senator, asked uh, rhetorically uh, on one occasion in the United States Senate whether any people in history uh, had ever voluntarily surrendered two billion dollars worth of property. And I think that's part of the answer, the enormous uh, capital investment in slaves. Also, uh, slavery was a viable labor system. It worked. Most slaves would be bought and sold in auction at least once in their lifetimes, with all the degradation and brutal upheaval such a transaction implied. Knowing little else but work from an early age, fed, dressed, and housed at their owner's whim, and expected to show humility to any white within sight, slaves were the absolute chattels of their masters, who could, in effect, do what they liked with them. The system was certainly profitable for some. Yet, out of such bleakness came that most moving of music, the Negro spiritual, which vividly expressed both the yearning for freedom by blacks and their surrender to sadness. While cotton growing was so lucrative, the slaves would not be given their freedom willingly. Demand for cotton was escalating, from England in particular. By the eve of the Civil War, the South was supplying Europe with nearly 90% of its cotton. Cotton, in fact, amounted to more than half of totally United States exports. 
Hence the boast among many Southerners that cotton was king and ruled the American economy. But as the South became ever more dependent on cotton, it became ever more dependent on slavery and determined not to give it up. The treatment of slaves varied, of course, from plantation to plantation. Well, of course, it depends upon what sources you read. You can find as much harshness and as much humaneness, perhaps, as you want to. I would say that on the whole, uh, slavery was harsh. But we're talking now not merely about uh, the animalistic aspects of harshness, but we're talking about the fact that human beings were kept in bondage. And I think that uh, any time that that occurs, it's, it's harsh. Uh, but uh, the advertisements for runaway slaves uh, reveal that uh, there was that also that animalistic aspect of harshness, too. Owners had to describe their slaves if they wanted them back. And all too often, they would speak of whelps on their back or this kind of mark or that kind of mark, which was a mark of violence. One remembers also that most planters regarded their slaves as children, childlike, uh, lacking in judgment or probity or uh, common sense. The 19th century instructed parents to punish their children so that the 19th century would punish any ward of any kind, punish by whipping, etc., to the extent that in some communities they had laws regulating uh, the number of lashes that one could receive. Although one must remember that uh, every owner was his own law and uh, in a position to decide himself how much punishment should be meted out. Blacks constituted a different race. As whites contemplated this different race, in the midst they were very fearful. Uh, they were fearful of uh, revolt. They were uh, fearful of uh, revenge. If uh, all these people were freed and, and stayed, uh, stayed amongst them. So they uh, felt that there was a great issue of racial uh, control that was involved in any discussion of uh, abolition. Uh, when, uh, quote, enlightened Southerners uh, thought about uh, these kinds of questions in the early part of the 19th century, uh, people like Thomas Jefferson, uh, who could consider the, uh, the question of uh, abolition, but only if blacks, uh, the freed blacks, were then colonized uh, outside of the United States because they were not considered part of the, uh, the body politic. Uh, they were uh, so strange as, uh, from some uh, perspective, some people as uh, almost to uh, constitute a subhuman uh, species. Blacks could only be accepted in Southern society as slaves. And I think to understand the South's defense of slavery is not just a question of the obvious economic advantages slavery offered to those who owned it, but also the extent to which slavery as a system kept the blacks in a position where non-slave holders, even though they may not like slavery, they could accept the presence of blacks. It's interesting to note in this regard that northerners had a real antipathy towards the presence of blacks and really were not at all eager to see blacks emancipated if it meant they were going to go north. Southerners were fighting to maintain a way of life. Well, the antebellum north is where segregation was invented. Uh, when emancipation came to the North in the aftermath of the American Revolution, it was more or less taken as a given uh, that integration was not likely to be possible. And in fact, where integration did occur, and in New York State most certainly, this is a, a fairly vivid example, the prior to 1822, it was possible for a black to vote. It was possible for a black to more or less become part of the uh, ongoing uh, <coughs> social norms within the uh, state of New York. The Constitution of 1822, which was a reform constitution, a democratic constitution, for specifically revoked the vote from the blacks. If you came to New York City, for all practical purposes, all forms of transportation were segregated. All forms of public facilities were segregated. Overall, I think what you can say is that segregation is a northern invention. And it may explain for why after the Civil War, when the Southerners attempted to introduce segregation and were immediately shot down, they were somewhat puzzled because what they felt they were doing was simply imitating the victorious North. 
Hypocritical though many Northerners may have been on race, they did focus attention not just on the iniquities of slavery, but on the misdeeds of slave owners. The thing that I think caused Southerners to be so hostile to Northerners about the institution of slavery was that Northerners now began not only to condemn the institution of slavery, which Southerners might concede, but they also began to condemn slaveholders as, as men of no principle, as men who were themselves immoral, as men who were themselves unchristian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so that slaveholders uh, who might have conceded there was something wrong about the institution of slavery, who might have said that uh, in the long run perhaps we ought to get rid of it, uh, would not concede that they themselves were the bad guys that uh, Northerners began to insist that they were. So they were determined, therefore, to resist the Northern attitudes and positions with respect to slavery with all the resources and all the vigor that they could summon, and they did. And it becomes really a sort of nasty fight after about 1830 to 35 because of the, the polarization of the North and South, not so much on the institution itself, but on those people who were involved in the institution, you see. And uh, Southerners did very much object to being called sinners and barbarous and that sort of thing. And that's what the Northern abolitionists and some that were not abolitionists began to call Southerners. The abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, founded in Boston in 1831, was the focal point of the anti-slavery movement. Its members were at first mainly middle class, mostly Quakers and evangelicals, and nearly all, of course, white. I think they represented the conscience of their section. They were out on the extreme. And for most of the period leading up to the Civil War, they did not constitute, I think, a very large group. But size, I think, is only one consideration. They were vocal. They were influential. They tended to occupy positions of prominence, which in turn perhaps amplified their voice uh, and gave them much more of a voice than their actual numbers may have merited. The main thing that the abolitionists did was to help convince a lot of Northerners who were not particularly concerned about slavery that the institution of slavery threatened them in the North. Uh, the abolitionists also, it's true, made progress in pointing out that slavery was a moral wrong, that it was an evil. But they broached this idea of a slave power conspiracy pretty early on you know, in the 1830s, 1840s. And as time went on, they could point to a lot of events that had occurred in national politics that seemed to bear out their assertions that there was a slave power in the South that was trying to take over the country. And by the 1850s, growing numbers of Northerners were filled with concern that this slave power was going to gain more control of the federal government and was going to damage their interests. It might inhibit their civil liberties, um, take away some of their freedoms, or uh, seize control of the territories for slavery and thereby make the territories an unattractive place for free farmers to go and, and start their own farms. Perhaps the single most powerful piece of propaganda the anti-slavery movement produced was Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which first appeared in 1851. An instant bestseller in the United States, it was also astonishingly successful in Europe, selling more than a million copies in England alone during its first year of publication. For many today, Mrs. Stowe's characters may perhaps appear stereotyped and her simple tale somewhat mawkish. But its account of white man's inhumanity to his weaker black brother struck a guilty chord in the North and helped broaden the abolitionists' appeal. Uncle Tom's cabin was a favorite subject for that most Victorian of family pastimes, the lantern slide reading. Walk that Tom up here right away, said Legree. The old cuss is at the bottom of this year whole matter. Tom heard the message with a forewarning heart, for he knew all the plan of the fugitive's escape. Well, Tom, said Legree, do you know I've made up my mind to kill you? It's very likely, Mazza, said Tom calmly. <laughs> 
It was but a moment, and Legree, foaming with rage, smote his victim to the ground. They washed his wounds. They provided a rude bed of some refuse cotton for him to lie down on. When George entered the shed, he felt his head giddy and his heart sick. Uncle Tom, my poor, poor old friend, I've come to buy you and take you home. Oh, Mazer George, you're too late. The Lord's bought me and is going to take me home. And with a smile, he fell asleep. But whatever the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin on the anti-slavery movement, the most emotionally charged episode in the developing clash between North and South over slavery occurred here, where the Shenandoah River joins the Potomac, some 50 miles northwest of Washington, Harper's Ferry, the location then of a government weapons factory. In October 1859, an anti-slavery hardliner, already wanted for suspected murder, led an attack on the undefended arsenal. Aiming to arouse the slave population of the South and use the captured guns to strike a fatal blow on its home soil at the hated institution of slavery. John Brown, whose raid this was, had with him only 18 men. It was a fiasco, and as a call to arms, it fell on deaf ears. His little group included five Negroes, as well as three of his own sons. They were soon surrounded by a larger force, and most of them killed or captured. Brown was tried for treason against the state of Virginia, found guilty, and, with six of his followers, executed within the month. The incident touched the South at its rawest nerve, the fear of an armed slave revolt. In the feverish mood that flourished then in the North, John Brown was crowned a martyr. Indeed, the day he was hanged, bells tolled in many New England churches while groups prayed openly for his soul. His testament read, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. Within a few years, Yankee soldiers would march into battle to the words of a new anthem. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. I think John Brown symbolized just what the Northern threat was. The fact was that John Brown raid failed, and yet to say only that is to mistake the importance of the John Brown raid. John Brown gave a human dimension to the Northern threat. John Brown was an outward and visible sign of what this growing and hostile northern majority portended for the South and was, I think, given the fact that this occurred on the eve of a momentous uh, presidential election campaign, uh, a warning to those Southerners of what they might expect. Certainly this was what was made of it by many of the Southern extremists. This is what you can expect. Uh, it was said over and over again, if these black Republicans should uh, succeed in the presidential election. As the map of the United States filled in during the decades before the Civil War, Southerners became obsessed with the balance between slave states and non-slave or so-called free labor states, mainly because under the American Constitution, each state, no matter what its size, sent two senators to Congress, where the Senate had the power effectively to block changes in legislation. Hitherto, the South had controlled the Senate and was determined to go on doing so for as long as possible. In this way, it could prevent any anti-slavery proposals becoming law. Bargaining and compromise had been the South's weapons to date, but the room for compromise was becoming less, and the opportunities for bargaining far fewer. The North was beginning to take a tougher line. I think westward expansion did really provide the catalyst which brought to the fore long-standing differences between North and South. After all, the question of the West really was a question of what the future of the whole country would become. Um, it, it affected the balance of power up until the 1840s, uh, the balance between free states and slave states had been very carefully maintained. But now this a whole new area, vast area, was brought into the Union, and it, 
it just reopened the question of what would the status of, of, of uh, this territory be, and therefore um, pushed slavery into the uh, realm of national politics from which it had been carefully excluded since the Missouri Compromise debates really 20 years before. So it made, westward expansion made slavery a national issue again uh, in the political system, which it hadn't really been for uh, quite a while. The vast area in question was Kansas and Nebraska, and the argument over whether slavery should be admitted to these former Indian territories brought people to blows. Both were north of the Missouri Compromise Line, and hence should clearly have been non-slave. That Southerners were trying to edge slavery into hitherto agreed forbidden areas alarmed many Northerners. The dispute broke up old political alliances and led to the formation of the Republican Party and the emergence of Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe, the rail splitter turned successful lawyer whose parents were semi-illiterate pioneers from Kentucky who had settled in the Midwest. A former Whig with a reputation for pragmatism and realism combined with a deep devotion to the Union. Lincoln had broken with his previous party over slavery. Lincoln emerged as leader, I think, for a number of reasons. Uh, I guess you would say he was very strategically located, both politically and intellectually, within the North. Politically, he represented the middle ground of the Republican Party. He was neither a radical nor a conservative, and he was acceptable to both. Um, he hated slavery, as he said, as much as any abolitionist. Nonetheless, he was committed to the Constitution, committed to the Union. He didn't believe the slavery issue should override every other consideration in politics. Um, he came from one of the key doubtful states, Illinois, which had to be carried by the Republican Party. Even within Illinois, he came from the middle part of the state, which was the swing ground within that state uh, in terms of carrying it. So as I say, he was located right in the middle, both physically, geographically, and intellectually, ideologically. And I think this gave him a great deal of a tr uh, you know, a power as an available candidate who could unite the whole Republican Party. Lincoln comes to the... Um comes to the scene in 1860 as in some ways a, a surprise. He was not a well-known politician prior to 1858 when he engaged in his famous debates with Stephen A. Douglas and those certainly gave him a prominence uh, in Republican and in national politics that he otherwise wouldn't have had. But I think the event that really brought Lincoln to the fore and which in a sense is at the root of the coming of the war itself was the uh, creation of the Republican Party in 1855-56, a party which was dedicated to questioning the existence of slavery in the territories. And Lincoln quickly became a prominent member within that party. And when uh, the time came in 1860 for a candidate to be chosen, he seemed to be one who had grasped the issue of slavery in a fairly moderate way as compared with, say, Seward, who was much more outspoken and had been much more outspoken on the question than Lincoln. Here in Charleston, South Carolina, the fateful 12 months that led up to the Civil War began and ended. Charleston then was a city of some 35,000 souls where the two rivers, the Ashley and the Cooper, came together, in the words of the local boast, to form the Atlantic Ocean. Charlestonians were given to extravagant behavior as well as comments. They consider themselves the very epitome of southernness and their fine city the focus of southern traditions and ideals. In April 1860, their gracious houses hosted the delegates to the Democratic Party convention, come to nominate a candidate for the presidential election that November. During the months following John Brown's raid, the atmosphere in the South had been charged. Many communities organized boycotts of northern goods. Militia units stepped up their training, nowhere more so than here in Charleston. The convention could not agree on a candidate and adjourned. Before it met again, the Republicans had nominated Abraham Lincoln as theirs. <laughs> 
When the Democrats did reconvene, they ended up with two rival candidates, which inevitably helped to ensure Lincoln's victory at the polls. Though not before an emotional campaign marked by assertions in the South that a Republican success would threaten their way of life, and hence justify their leaving the Union. Secession, as it was known. There was mention, too, for the first time, of a Confederacy. Lincoln's election was the cause of Southern secession. Uh, this is because the Republican Party was viewed by many as an abolitionist party uh, that, that intended uh, to emancipate slavery uh, immediately. Uh, more accurately, it was perceived by Southerners as an anti-Southern party. Uh, as a party that was exclusively northern, uh, that did, could not and did, did not represent southerners because it had shunned uh, southern support. Uh, it was a party whose basic platform was denunciation of the so-called slave power uh, or slaveocracy, uh, the political power uh, of southern slaveholders. And therefore, southerners believed that if the nation was ruled by a party that did not include southerners, they were losing self-government. Uh, which they saw, uh, I think, as their primary uh, political goal and value, and therefore they couldn't tolerate a government run uh, by this alien party. Uh, and hence Lincoln's election uh, was very much a red flag to the Southern Bull. The chief thing Southerners disliked about the North was that the North was determined to solve what the South saw as its own problems. The North was telling the South what it must do about slavery. But there's something else also. Northerners were telling Southerners that because they owned slaves, because slavery existed, the South was somehow un-American, the South was somehow immoral, and Southerners cherished their Americanism. Southerners bowed to no one as patriots, as loyal Americans, and certainly Southerners had no intention of saying or admitting or recognizing that they were immoral. Absolutely not. The seven states of the Deep South did not even wait for Lincoln to be inaugurated as president. South Carolina, as usual, led the way. Within hours of Lincoln's victory, the state legislature there had called for a special convention to consider secession. Within the month, it had met at Charleston and agreed unanimously to take South Carolina out of the Union. Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas all followed within a matter of weeks. In February 1861, representatives from these seven seceding states met at Montgomery, Alabama to elect Jefferson Davis, a senator from Mississippi, as their first president and to agree a constitution for the so-called Confederate States of America. Though North and South now seemed set on a collision course, was war really inevitable? It's very possible to imagine a compromise but I think some resolution of the slavery problem was unavoidable. This was Lincoln's point. A national crisis must be reached and passed, he said in the House Divided speech. So the question really was, would the South accept a national judgment on the, what Lincoln called the ultimate extinction or the future extinction of slavery? That's what his rep election represented. A majority of the country, of course, representing the North, made that decision. So I think some kind of conflict was inevitable, but it could have taken a political form. I don't think it had to take a military form. On the other hand, it's hard to imagine any way in which the Southern leadership, the ruling class, the slave-owning class of the South, would have voluntarily or peacefully accepted its own extinction. So if you say that, then I think you have to say that at some point, conflict was inevitable. It didn't have to happen in 1861, but Another compromise in 1861 would not have lasted any longer than the previous compromises had lasted. I think one has to say that slavery was at the root of the coming of the Civil War. But I think if one looks at it a little, little more closely, one sees that really the question can be broken down into two parts. Slavery was the cause for the South's secession. Uh, the South, by the 1850s, had come to see slavery as, they like to say, its peculiar institution. I didn't mean that peculiar in the sense of odd, they meant it was ours. Uh, and uh, it identified them. And increasingly, Southerners allowed themselves to be identified by slavery. So every time a Northerner said something unfavorable uh, about slavery, uh, it seemed to be an attack on slaveholders. And of course, the abolitionists uh, argued that slaveholders were immoral people, that to hold slaves was an immoral act. And of course, for Southerners who had grown up within that institution, that seemed to be a personal as well as a regional insult. 
uh, so that uh, uh, Southerners uh, saw slavery as very essential to them. And uh, it was, I think, at the root of the reason for secession. Uh, they put it in somewhat different terms when they seceded. Uh, they said it was the right to govern their own existence. But the point of issue, of course, between North and South for the preceding 30 years had been that difference of Southerners from Northerners, which was the holding of slaves in the South. But whether a war came was another question, and that, it seems to me, was a Northern issue. It was conceivable, after all, that the North would not uh, use force in, in order to hold the South uh, in the Union. Uh, there, were, uh, there were Northerners, like Horace Greeley, who talked, at least briefly, of uh, letting the Erring Sisters depart in peace. Uh, there were abolitionists, like Wendell Phillips, uh, who argued uh, uh, that we didn't want a nation in which you had to be, it had to be held together by force. The United States had been uh, proud of the fact that it was a nation held together by the will of its people, and not by standing armies, uh, not by uh, uh, force, uh, as the, was the case in certain European countries. Southerners flocked to the colors. Entire families rushed to join their state militias. Young bloods stared into the newfangled camera lens. Their weapons perhaps primitive, but their patriotism fired as they hurried to be among the 100,000 strong force Jefferson Davis was recruiting to oppose the Federal Army, then a mere 16,000. Some of the rebel recruits even brought their slaves, like knights of old with their esquires. That these slaves might be aiding a fight to perpetuate their own bondage was an irony not lost on many Northerners. Meanwhile, in Washington, the unfinished new Capitol seemed to symbolize the North's political disarray. Under a quirk, then, of the American Constitution, five months would pass between the president being elected and taking office. Here in Washington, the reins of government at this supremely critical time for the Union were still in the hands of the previous Democratic and generally pro-Southern administration, which, not surprisingly, showed little inclination to act decisively against the seceded states. Work went on to complete the Capitol Dome, even while the new president was being smuggled into the city incognito because of fears for his life. Washington was, of course, surrounded by slave states whose loyalty was far from certain. Buchanan, the outgoing president, was by now thoroughly discredited. Congress was deserted as many Confederate supporters hastened southwards. A crowd of 30,000 came to see Abraham Lincoln inaugurated as the 16th president of the United States. Sharpshooters were posted to discourage Southern attempts to assassinate him. In his address, Lincoln vowed to avoid war, but not everyone was convinced he could do so now. The chances of finding a peaceful solution were remote. They have, I think, to do with a number of very complicated kinds of issues. The easiest to deal with, political. Could Lincoln, for example, have backed down after having been elected on a platform that said we will never see the extension of slavery to any further territories. He couldn't without committing political suicide, nor could his Republican coalition have existed long had he made such a decision. Now, such a decision could have been made, perhaps it should have been made in the interest of the country, but political necessity said no, and the same would be true on the Confederate side. There would also be the economic forces that militate against any kind of long-range solution to this problem. With billions of dollars invested in slaves in the South, the question was, how were you going to recommend slave owners? Where would the money come from? No one thought of appropriating federal money to pay the slave owners, and it probably would have been immoral to do so in any case. What would you think if you were a very wealthy South Carolina planter who found all of your labor being stricken from you, just taken away immediately by emancipation? Those economic forces meant that it really wasn't easy to think of any kind of solution. Then when you add to that the fundamental, what I think fundamental at any rate, psychological forces of racism, the fact that the slaves were of a different race, that they were black, that nobody, North or South, could see any way of working them into the body politic, into civil society as free men. Those three things together, the political, economic, and psychological dimensions, seem to be pretty well to rule out any kind of long-range, peaceful, compromise solution.
Charleston, South Carolina, appropriately enough, was where the dramatic events that finally led to war took place. The secession of the seven states had presented the federal government with all manner of administrative problems, from delivery of mail to enforcement of law and order. But these did not in themselves threaten a military conflict between North and South. The presence within some of the seceding states of federal forts manned by federal garrisons was a different matter. Many were quickly abandoned, but Fort Moultrie here at Charleston, and more particularly its sister fort, Sumter, in the middle of Charleston Harbor, were less easy to let go. Soon they had taken on a symbolic value out of all proportion to their military importance. The Confederacy feared that its case for recognition as a sovereign nation would be compromised as long as another power maintained an armed presence within one of its main harbors. While for the federal authority, it was a question of the loss of face if the forts were surrendered to states in rebellion. Just a month after Lincoln's inauguration, a final attempt by Washington to relieve and replenish Fort Sumter was made. The unarmed convoy was due to arrive off Charleston the night of April 11th, 12th. Two days before that, the local Confederate general called on Major Robert Anderson, the federal commander of the fort, to surrender. Anderson waited 24 hours before declining, realizing the inevitable response and trusting in a more divine providence. Knowing the northern relief ships were hourly due, the Confederates began firing on Fort Sumter at 4.30 a.m. on April 12, 1861, watched by a crowd of eager Charlestonians. The bombardment lasted 34 hours, with more than 4,000 rounds being shot off in the direction of the luckless fort and a mere 1,000 rounds being fired in reply before Anderson decided he and his hundred or so men had had enough. The local newspaper rushed out a special edition The damage to the fort was extensive, though miraculously no one had been killed. Four of the garrison had been wounded, as had four of the Confederate gunners on shore. Indeed, the only deaths happened later, when a Federal soldier died while firing a salute during the surrender ceremony, and another was fatally injured in an ensuing explosion. Alas, they were to be merely the first of many, as America's bloodiest struggle got underway. With the secessionists having fired on the flag, northerners rallied to defend the Union. Baffled and bemused before, they now knew where they stood and seemed relieved. The months of inactivity gave way to frenzied preparations. Patriotism reared its head as the northern states vied with each other to supply recruits for the Union cause. Most were eager to reply in kind for Sumter as soon as possible. In the South, the Sumter success raised secessionist fervor to fever pitch. Recruits rushed to join up. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to volunteer for the Confederate Army, anxious not to miss out on the great adventure, keen to have the opportunity of taking part, now that the argument between North and South was to be settled by force of arms. Sumter appeared to confirm the conventional wisdom that one Southerner could whip ten Yankees. The Times correspondent reported from Charleston, secession is the fashion here. Young ladies sing for it, old ladies pray for it, young men are dying to fight for it. But Sumter had destroyed for the South the dream that its independence could be won without a fight. It brought, however, four more states into the Confederate camp, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Lines were being drawn and positions taken. The Charleston batteries had put an end to the years of bickering over slavery and states' rights. Might was now to settle it all. <laughs> 
As the troops on both sides sweated to get into battle trim, marched and countermarched to keep up their morale, the war was about to begin in earnest.